Good morning, everybody, and a good afternoon for those of you tuning in from a different geography. Um, welcome to this second webinar in a series on African women as pillars of resilience. My name is Eddie Mandry, Director for Africa and Middle East at Yale University. Um, we have an outstanding uh, session today on a critically important issue. And uh, we are really delighted to have uh, women speakers from around the continent uh, who will speak to this question of safeguarding the well being uh, and security of women and girls uh, in this age of COVID 19. Um, I'd like to just say a little bit about our partners uh, in this effort. Uh, this is a program that's one of the flagships of the Yale Africa Initiative. It's a program pr produced in partnership with uh, Banco Santander, particularly Santander Universities, uh, and also in partnership with the Women for Africa Foundation, uh, spearheaded by uh, Maria Teresa Fernandez de la Vega. Uh, and it is through this collaboration that we've had the opportunity to convene at Yale senior African women leaders from across Africa, uh, spanning uh, every region of the continent, uh, who have achieved a significant amount of success and leadership on the continent and are also very keen uh, in making sure there's a multiplier in terms of their impact in strengthening the pipeline for emerging women leaders on the continent, uh, but also on discussing critical issues of the day. Um, I would just like to find out uh, if Miss um, Maria Teresa Fernandez de la Vega is on. Uh, please bear with me. Yes, it looks like they're all prepared. Excellent. So I'd like to hand over to uh, Miss Maria Teresa Fernandez de la Vega uh, so she can offer a few remarks before we proceed into the session. Thank you very much. Okay, so we, we will proceed and we'll have uh, Miss Maria Teresa Fernandez de la Vega give some concluding remarks. Um, Right now, I'd like to introduce our first uh, speaker and moderator uh, who is chairing this event. Uh, it's really a tremendous honor to have with us uh, how our, sorry, uh, Dr. Deko Mohammed. Uh, she is a Yale World Fellow. She's also the CEO of the Hawa Abdi Foundation. She's tuning into this session all the way from Somalia and we're absolutely delighted to have us. So I will hand over to you, Deco. Um, please lead us into this conversation. Thank you so much, Eddie. Um, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. It's an honor and a pleasure to moderate this session. It's, uh, I'm delighted to be uh, uh, moderating and asking important key questions for a, a panelist who has expertise in this uh, and this year, the world celebrates the 20th anniversary of UN Security Council landmark resolution on women, peace, and security. And to date, more than 80 countries have adopted the National Action Plan for Women, Peace, and Security. However, this year has also thrown into the sharp focus the urgent need to fully realize the women's leadership and urgency in shaping the system and policy framework that can help foster security, peace, and stability the, around the globe. Um, I want to jump right away and, and to introduce, I would like to, I hope all of, all of you are here to hear our panelists who are experts in this field in making secure our um, African woman as a pillar of resilience. Uh, I would like to introduce our first panelist. We have amazing four panelists and the first one, and I wanna give all, in, all of you uh, as a panelist five minutes to give us a background of your expertise and what is going on and how we can secure a woman and the well-being of women and girls in, in the continent. So our first panelist, uh, it's Anana Oya Banoe Adoa. And um, I apologize for my East African accent from West African names, is a former Minister for Gender, Children, and Social Protection in Ghana. She, ha she held this position since 2013. She has also served as the Chief Executive Director for Human Rights Advocacy Center. And she worked 
as a regional coordinator of African Office for Commonwealth Human Rights Initiatives. She received several awards, worked advocacy in members of international consumptions, uh, reproductive rights, uh, medical apportion. She received her um, uh, Vera Chair Award for Human Rights in Africa from Center for Human Rights at the University of Pretoria, South Africa. She has an outstanding performance and protection of human rights in Africa in 2017, and many, many more. She's a lawyer, bachelor in law degree, finished the school in Accra, master in law, human rights democratization in Africa, or from University of Pretoria, South Africa. I will welcome you, this panel, for five minute remarks. It's an honor to have you here. Welcome, Nana. Thank you very much. Good morning and good afternoon to you all. And thanks to um, all of you for uh, convening this very critical and important session um, on um, the resilience and impact on, on, on women and girls in Africa. So uh, uh, the first thing, the first we talk about the structural threats to the safety of women and girls in Africa and the impact um, of the uh, pandemic. The first is enhanced vulnerabilities. So I received a call from a girl in the northern part of Ghana, not from her, from her friends. What is happening? School is out of session and she is being subjected to child marriage because she's at home and she doesn't have the protection of that school environment. She's been given up for marriage at the age of 13. And this is the practical um, reality for young girls and how vulnerable they have become in this era um, of um, COVID. We also have a situation, the very basics. 90% of our working population work within the informal sector. So as I went around in my country during the lockdown, with, of course with the permit, I met a man who is a mason, and he had not been able to provide for his family because he, he, there was lockdown and he could not go to work. So food, shelter, clothing, access to healthcare was a basic problem. One would expect the government to step in, but what do we have? Social welfare, social services, social protection, and safety nets are not a major priority for our governments, and we don't have an effective, efficient safety net or social protection mechanism. So our governments, some of our governments in Africa, are even unable to target and identify our vulnerable populations. Even when they have the resources, and even when they have um, supplies, because we don't have an efficient social protection mechanism, uh, African, some of our African governments are not able to target. So we have more vulnerabilities. And then we have a situation where even when there are resources, government does not have adequate resources to provide for our populations who need help. So I have an 18-year-old woman who is diabetic, who is not able to go to hospital because she lives far away from her family. And then she, she gets a relapse and there's no ambulance. So these are the practical um, issues that have occurred during um, this uh, period and the, and, the, and the sort of structural threats. Another one is the sociocultural. Within our African traditional societies, we have certain customs and certain norms. And so I've mentioned child marriage, there's also gender-based violence. You're stuck in the house with your abuser. Who do you call? Who comes to your aid? And, and these are some of the practical uh, problems and issues that uh, we have had to confront with during this um, um, COVID era in some African countries and within some African societies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nana. Nana, you, you touched very important points. We already had the challenges and it add up. Because of the COVID thing, 
exacerbated. So I want to introduce next panelist. Uh, so uh, our it's a uh, Candy Anduzuba. Uh, she's a Congolese lawyer, journalist, and activist for women's rights. Who main focus is fighting sexual violence. She graduated from the University of Okubu in 2005 with a degree of in law. She held found Yun Altoza Bara El Salvatore Network. She is a member of East Congo Media Women Associate, Association and co-founder of the Women Alliance for Prote uh, Promotion of, of Human Rights. J'ai eu un petit euh, souci technique, euh, donc je vous ai rejoint un peu, un peu en retard, mais heureusement je suis là. Alors, euh, merci aussi pour euh, cette opportunité, mais je salue également tous les panélistes euh, et ceux qui nous suivent. Et moi, j'interviens depuis l'est de la RDC, dans la petite ville de Bukavu où j'habite et je travaille. Alors, cette opportunité est vraiment euh, très, très nécessaire pour nous de parler de l'impact de la COVID-19 et sur les femmes et leur résilience. Et ici chez nous, à l'est de la RDC, à un RDC en général, l'impact de la COVID-19 est vraiment remarquable, vraiment remarquable dans le sens qu'elle a touché la vie au quotidien des femmes. Et surtout, je vais aborder le point économique. Les femmes de la province de Kivu ont subi depuis des années des affres de guerre les femmes ont, ont été les premières victimes des conflits et aujourd'hui j'en profite pour dire que nous avons euh, célébré au fait le dixième anniversaire du rapport Mamping qui est la cartographie de crimes euh, le plus grave commise en RDC que nous sommes en train de demander la fin de l'impunité et tout ça, ça vient à un point nommé où euh, nous sommes en train de vivre une situation vraiment très compliqué et très grave parce que cette résilience qu'avait la femme, que la femme a réussi à se construire depuis plusieurs années à force de savoir vivre avec les affres de guerre, les conséquences des guerres, la femme a réussi à se construire. Et puis économiquement, elle est toujours dans l'informel, elle a réussi à se créer un environnement plus ou moins euh, acceptable avec euh, le temps, elle avait l'espérance euh, de mieux évoluer. Mais malheureusement, la COVID-19 est venue pour vraiment nous arracher cette espérance que nous avons construite depuis longtemps. Et aujourd'hui, les petites femmes commerçantes qui se sont construites à l'est de la RDC ou disons en général en RDC, qui sont des petites commerçantes informelles, se sont vues bloquées dans leurs activités de chaque jour. Et je peux donner un exemple où j'ai travaillé avec à peu près 600 femmes réunies dans les associations villageoises d'épargne et de crédit. Ces femmes ont réussi pendant une période de trois ans à se focaliser sur leur petit commerce afin de se reconstruire après la guerre. Et ainsi, ces femmes après la COVID ou pendant cette période de COVID, elles ont réchuté. Elles arrivaient même à se faire 30 000 dollars dans leur petite caisse. Mais aujourd'hui, elles ne savent plus continuer parce qu'elles ont réchuté et elles ne gardent que 5 000 dollars américains. Et ça, ça, ça nous amène à nous poser beaucoup de questions sur la survie de ces femmes-là. Et nous sommes en train de développer des stratégies pour vivre avec la COVID, mais aussi pour nous aider à sortir de cette impasse. Plusieurs euh, activités et stratégies sont euh, développées pour euh, nous en sortir et pour euh, essayer un peu de remonter la pente et redonner encore à la femme euh, cette espérance et vivre dans la résilience. Euh, toujours euh, par rapport à cette opportunité, on demande de parler de la, euh, de la résolution 1325. Cette résolution 1325, notre pays l'a accueillie vraiment chaleureusement avec un plan national d'implantation. Euh, nous, euh, nous avons implémenté la, la 1325, les lois nationales ont été votées par rapport à la protection et la sécurité de la femme. Mais aujourd'hui, euh, nous n'avons pas structurellement, nous n'avons pas des structures pour accompagner en fait, les lois qui euh, accompagnent, qui sécurisent les femmes. Les lois sont là, mais structurellement, nous n'avons pas à cet accompagnement-là 
pour, euh, pour que les lois soient appliquées. Les femmes continuent toujours de régresser, les femmes continuent à de souffrir et, et avec euh, la COVID-19, ça devient un peu plus compliqué. Et donc, nous sommes en train de, de réfléchir sur des stratégies novatrices, sur des stratégies que nous pouvons mettre en place afin de, 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 de continuer cette résilience. Merci. Oh, thank you so much. You touched a very important point is economic hardship as World Bank report uh, mentioned 90% of subsets suffered because of the COVID time because she not only domestic violence and sexual uh, violence in their own homes. So we're going to move to the next panelists, and I'm very delighted to all of you who already men, uh, spoken. The two is coming next to us to mention very critical area that COVID-19 affected the way the COVID-19 affected in women in Africa. Uh, next, our panelist is Julia Dukana Kasala, is a farm, is a former minister of gender, children and social protection in Liberia. She played a critical role in shaping and coordinating the government of Liberia's national gender policy through the in, in, enabling of gender, uh, gender mainstream as a goal of achieving gender parity and equality. Um, I'm delighted to introduce to her in this panel. She worked in, in a banking in the United States. She also received her degree in business from Texas University and University of Phoenix in California. Julia, welcome to the floor. Thank you. Uh, let me say a big thank you to the rest of the panelists. My friend and sister, Nana, um, from Ghana, Eddie, and all others on this platform. And to talk about the effect of women and girls as it relates to COVID-19. But you do know that like, you are one of the first African countries that uh, developed the National Action Plan as it relates to 1325. So we're proud of that. But we're talking about COVID-19, the effect of COVID-19 on women and girls. Um, Liberia was one of those first countries that had a complete lockdown. And because of that, all of our kids were out of school. Women couldn't go to the market, so with curfew, the times were changed from one to another. Um, people were out of jobs, businesses were closed. And so it left a lot of our women and girls very, very vulnerable especially our adolescent girls. And because of that, rape became on the increase. And so young activists, young uh, actors in GBV got together and decided to protest. And they decided to wear black every Thursday to show what was happening and how, it, how bad the situation was. And it took so much by surprise, the number just grew and grew and grew and grew. They got so big and government got involved. Our former president, Madam Ellen Johnson Serif, actually got involved and went to the protester. And because of that, the president, His Excellency Dr. George Manawia, decided to call a conference of all the actors of GBV, SGBV, to talk about the way forward to find out, to come out with a roadmap because it got so bad that three months old, six months old were all being raped because men were home and being bored. They had nothing to do and they took their aggression on the women and the young girls. I mean, domestic violence became the norm of the day. Rape became the language that everybody spoke. But after the conference, we declared rape an emergency in Liberia. He has put together a task force that is uh, coping, the, coping the, the roadmap to see how we go from prevention, protection, and persecution. Um, it is so bad in the, in the country right now, even with the state of emergency. COVID-19 has not only destroyed the fabric of our society as it is to adolescent girls and women, but even the men. Our boys have been solemnized. I mean, businesses have shut down. Uh, companies are leaving 
because nothing, I mean, it's, it's just bad. How do we fix it? How do we move forward? Um, so this platform is where we share information, where we share ideas, and we all can work. We are still working with our girls, our young girls and women. And we know West Africa right now is in a political season. And because of that, it makes it even harder to make funding available to the Ministry of Gender, Children, and Social Protection to help the vulnerable population. That is, it's never enough. We always say the envelope. There's never enough in the envelope to help the people that need it the most. But that's enough for politics. That's enough for everything else. But there's never enough for the vulnerable population of our society. Our young girls, our children, our boys. When we say children, we're talking about both boys and girls. Our adolescent girls, they have been out of school for so long. Unlike other countries, the internet system here is so bad. So learning by e-learning is so hard. It makes it difficult because the parents cannot afford to buy data. And like Ghana, we are in the rainy season. And so maybe while I'm on this platform, the network will go off. It's in and out. It's not consistent. So how are these students in the universities, in high schools, are going to do their lessons by e-learning when they do not have the capacity, when their parents cannot afford to buy them a tablet or laptop? Government is not providing that for them. So they are all in the streets selling. They are all very vulnerable. And I mean, I want that. I can't, I can't stress it so much what is happening to our young people. The educational system is not strong enough that our students from the university level can cope with COVID-19. And COVID-19, you know we had Ebola, but Ebola was only in a few countries in West Africa. But COVID-19 is the whole world. So who do you go to for help? How do you get, how do you get help to help these young people? And not only the young people, our widows, our elderly, how do we help the disabled community? Uh, so it's a serious problem, but our president has declared emergency on RIP, but RIP is not the only issue. So what part of the emergency are we going to work on right now? Uh, that's activists and social workers are working along with the current Minister of Gender, Children, and Social Protection to see how we can bring some relief to what is happening to our young people. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks. Wonderful remarks. I'm going to now introduce the last panelist to, um, to share with us her remarks. Julia Kamutu is the president of Karibu New Youth Associate South Kiva, president of Kira Geneza Vanolas. Julia is the trained lawyer and a specialist in journalism applied to law gender and conflict management. Her expertise is in gender-based violence, legal coverage of criminal and civil trials, international justice, human rights, and good governance and democracy. She won an award for best reporting on UNDP gender-based violence in 2009. Julia, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, welcome. Merci beaucoup, bonsoir, mesdames. Je suis très, très heureuse de venir de la marche de la société civile pour réclamer l'installation et la création du tribunal pénal international à l'ERDC. Alors, je vais parler de violence faite sur la fin de la période de coronavirus ici à l'ERDC, au sud du Kivu, plus particulièrement. Et donc, cette période a été très, très difficile sur le coup de femmes. De la RDC. La période le coronavirus est venue à se dater la situation de la femme. Je veux dire que certaines fois, des violences qui se sont accablées en cette période de coronavirus. Tout d'abord, les violences des pas de paix. Quand je parle de violences des pas de paix, je ne peux pas vous entendre. Je pense que nous allons passer à Deco pour que vous puissiez avoir le. Begin asking some of the questions of the audience, and we'll see if we're able to resolve the technical issues with Caddy's connection. Uh, Deco, over to you, please. Yeah, I 
I might first start asking a couple of questions to our three panelists who are their connection is more available, like a, a general question, um, which is, I would like to ask you uh, on your point of view, what impact has the global pandemic and on the well-being of the women and the girls? What do you consider to be the foremost structure threats to the safety of women and children around Africa. I, I would like to you to mention something maybe more generic, more natural to the to African context. Thank you. The question is to all the panelists. Maybe Nana, you can start. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, I, I believe I mentioned a few in my um, intro. And um, sitting from where, from here, for me, one big issue uh, for us was um, the ability of our government to support, protect, and cater for women, for the elderly, for persons with disabilities, and also to especially to protect our young girls. So it was uh, that um, we now had a pandemic on our hands. We had a lockdown and overnight we didn't have that uh, safety or that, that protection. So it really uh, became very glaring and exposed our government system and the extent to which even our traditional systems in our African societies and our government systems could, in, uh, on when um, an emergency occurs or there's a humanitarian crisis, the extent to which our government system's safety net system was resilient, and even the extent to which our traditional um, community or network was resilient enough to step in at this unplanned time to protect our vulnerable uh, population. So this was something that became very glaring and I'm happy that at least um, we all came together to try to address the situation of the pandemic in one way or the other. But this, this is what um, was very glaring to me from where I sit. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Um, Julia, do you want to add any remarks? on that question or are we going to move to the question from the chat? I see one important question someone asked. Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. You're welcome, Candy. Uh, let me just, uh, uh, oui, uh, au fait, uh, par rapport à la question, Euh, sur euh, la, la résilience, mais aussi euh, euh, structurellement parlant, donc euh, les principales menaces structurelles euh, à la sécurité des femmes. Et nous, euh, nous avons vécu, euh, je crois que ça a été euh, un aspect général hein, à travers euh, l'Afrique, euh, l'accès aux soins de santé, surtout à la population vulnérable, comme l'a dit euh, Nana Puyo, Madame Nana. Et donc, nous aussi, nous avons vécu la même chose. L'accès de femmes aux soins de santé était compliqué parce que, pour nous, le gouvernement n'a pas réussi à organiser euh, cet accès aux soins de santé par rapport euh, à la pandémie de la COVID-19. Et tenez-vous prêt, il fallait payer euh, les soins de santé, ça coûtait énormément, très cher. Et euh, sur le plan économique, la femme, elle est la plus pauvre et la plus vulnérable, et donc c'était très compliqué. Et aussi, euh, le gouvernement n'a pas réussi à structurer ou à accompagner les femmes dans cette période de pandémie sur le plan économique. Les femmes qui sont dans l'économie informelle, c'est elles qui portent vraiment, généralement, euh, cette économie informelle du pays. Mais pendant la COVID-19, pendant toute cette, euh, cette période, eh bien, voilà que ces femmes étaient délaissées 
euh, à leur triste sort, il n'y a jamais eu d'accompagnement, il n'y a jamais eu des mesures euh, gouvernementales pour dire que nous allons vraiment aider ces femmes à, faire, à, à mieux faire euh, leur travail ou à continuer. Des sur Donc, c'était vraiment euh, euh, compliqué sur le plan culturel. Rien n'a accompagné les femmes, même sur la santé. Jusqu'à aujourd'hui, c'est toujours compliqué. Thank you for your remarks. Uh, there's a question on the chat. What is the best way to help the women and children who are stuck at home with the abuser during the lockdown? So from my experience in Somalia, I want to share with that and the panelists to ask questions to think about it. In Somalia, we had very short time lockdown and that increased the the number skyrocketing number of female genital mutilation because the children girls were out of the schools they were home they were easy to be to mutilate and also to give early child marriage so what do you experience in your own country how we could help that situation in a woman and the girls who are locked down in homes uh, economical hardship, healthcare issues, no access to healthcare, you have abuser in the house, you have the government who's not even thinking, because most of the government are thinking about COVID-19 and the ventilators. No one thought about the basic um, delivery hospitals and provided uh, access to the women to delivering in safe for COVID-19. So please, uh, if you touch in your experience in your area, and on top of that, is there any legislative rules and um, policy we can create learning from COVID experience? Thank you. So um, I hope I can I can just offer what um, you we didn't have any response, but the UNFPA in Ghana, what UNFPA did was to support our Ministry of Gender, Children and Social Protection to create a hotline, uh, create a hotline and then across board get volunteers, uh, clinical psychologists, doctors, lawyers, um, social workers across board um, to provide um, services, pro bono services for um, likely survivors of um, gender-based violence, child marriage, rape and what have you. So um, immediately, this was what our government um, with support from UNFPA did. And then UNFPA also immediately uh, provided the dignity kits. Something as simple as sanitary pads, toothpaste, toothbrushes, um, towels, underwear. UNFPA was able to provide that and um, supplied across the country. So these were some of the immediate um, interventions that help. But then, in terms of the law and the policy, it showed that there was a need to have an emergency response mechanism, either a law, a policy, or a strategic framework. That would be gender sensitive. So that, like you said, it's not about ventilator, because all we're hearing was testing and ventilators and PPEs and what have you, and not hearing about even the ability for a woman whose husband has taken over custody of her children, the ability for her to have access to those children because there was no court in session. So these were some of the practical issues and there's a need for us to have an emergency response law or policy in frame that is gender sensitive and that takes um, um, cognizance of all these issues and challenges. Thank you. Thank you. I have another question. I apologize. Most, some of the questions are in French. I don't speak French, so I'm going to go through only English ones. One question is going specifically to co our Congolese panelist, and it's asking what are the national policies that you have initiated to support the imp implementation of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action in Congo? So please, can uh, oui, je, je suis là. Donc, euh, par rapport à, à cela, il y a eu euh, normalement le, le gouvernement congolais a des problèmes euh, d'accompagner des actions de femmes et la protection de femmes. 
et euh, au Congo c'est l'inverse c'est la société civile qui essaye un peu d'être de beaucoup plus dynamique pour essayer un peu de pallier à cette absence par rapport à ce point-là euh, du gouvernement euh, sur ces questions. Et donc, les sociétés civiles, les différentes organisations de la société civile se sont penchées sur la question pour mettre en place de, de mécanismes d'accompagnement et aussi également essayer de les impliquer le gouvernement par rapport à ça. Mais jusque-là, c'est juste coucher des, des recommandations ou de, de, euh, de mesures couchées sur papier qui ne suivent pas, au fait, parce que c'est bien beau, la société civile peut faire des recommandations euh, mais il faudra que le gouvernement puisse essayer de, 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 de prendre des mesures d'accompagnement adéquates pour essayer un peu de relever les défis. Mais pour le moment, jusque-là, ça reste l'affaire de la société civile. Nous, nous sommes toujours en train de déplorer le fait que nous ne sommes pas accompagnés par notre gouvernement par rapport à toutes ces questions liées à la protection de la femme, que ce soit pendant la période de la pandémie de la COVID-19 qui est venue compliquer encore plus la misère de cette femme-là, de, 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 de la population vulnérable. Mais aujourd'hui, bon, nous continuons toujours à faire de notre mieux pour essayer un peu de booster notre gouvernement afin qu'il puisse bien faire leur travail. Donc, c'est très désolant que nous, au niveau du Congo, nous ne soyons pas accompagnés par notre propre gouvernement et nous sommes en train de nous battre nous-mêmes, disons la société civile. Et euh, ces questions restent toujours pendantes parce qu'on euh, ne peut pas faire grand-chose si la situation... Euh, demeure euh, préoccupante par rapport à l'accompagnement technique et structurel de notre gouvernement. Voilà. Thank you. Um, thank you. I have another interesting question. It's saying how do how do we help women restart their small business which was affected by lockdown many women are the major um, i think that question i would ask for her, how our small business women around continents affected by lockdown and how they can restart their business can you hear me julia yes 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 let me say taking experience from the ebola uh, in Liberia, a lot of women came from zero to be heroes, where they had started their own businesses with help from microcredits and government and their empowerment programs. And the Ebola hit cross borders, the rural women, our market women, and our young women who, who were involved in traveling to China, to other African countries and buying their goods. And for what government did right at the end of Ebola was to strengthen them, to make sure that the, the interest on loans that they are taking from the banks were waived, and to give them some startup money to be able to build them up. Because the women are the ones who take care of their homes. They take care of the family. The men go to work, yes, but they use their money for other things. The woman always have to make sure her child have something to eat in the morning and in the evening before they go to bed. Uh, so looking at women being locked down during the COVID-19, we are asking government to do the same thing, to provide stimulus packages that will enable women to continue the businesses that they were doing. Market business were closed. I mean, they couldn't get anything and these women took loans from the bank and they have to pay them back. So those interests have to be relieved if they can, but when the government can make those decisions, the Ministry of Gender, Children and Social Protection have to be empowered, budgetary allotment has to be made so that they can empower and continue to provide the safety net. We have what called social protection, where you give to the less fortunate, where you help them to come from, to move from zero, to be heroes again in their own communities. So it, it, is, it is a problem right now because a lot of the companies have left, have shut down. COVID-19 is still going on. 
So even though people are returning to their regular businesses, but it's not as productive as before because people are not buying as much. People are not spending as much. People are not going out to restaurants or cook shops as we call them in Liberia. They are not doing that now. So a lot of those people who are depending, even real estate, everybody's working from home. So real estate has shut down. The clinics, you're not getting medication in like you used to. So a lot of the clinics and midwifery places that are run by women are all being shut down because of COVID-19. So the way forward is to make sure that government can come in and help these people to get back on their feet. Thank you, Julia. Thank you for your remarks. I, I have another very important question was asked by Merle Vanua. Um, our question is, has, what has to do uh, mental health? This pandemic has affected so many women, neglected, especially women headed family, head of the family. Some have lost jobs and then the rate of early marriage has raised and there's a lot of gender-based violence in home. What can we do to help ensure that the mental health status of these women are helped? So anyone in your own government, your work, your country, any uh, focus on the mental health, please share. Well, mental health. Go, go ahead, go ahead, Julia. Mental health, drug abuse, it's on the rise. There have been there were programs put in place, but were never implemented. And like I said before, when it comes to mental health, when it comes to the issue of social services, the envelope is never big enough. How can we get our government to start seeing that you can build all the skyscrapers? You can build all the rules. If your people are not protected, they won't understand what it is to use the skyscraper or to move on the car rules. So what happens in case of, of, of uprising, these very structures are destroyed because mentally the people are devastated. So you have to, as you build the skyscrapers, as you build the rules, you have to, make sure that the people are safe. You have to make sure that mentally they are ready, they are prepared. So psychosocial is an issue in our country that we don't put a lot into. Our people came from having something to having nothing. They went through trauma, they went through the war. We did the disarmament. And when we thought we were making progress, we had the Ebola. Right after Ebola, when we thought we were making progress, we've been stuck with COVID-19. So the issue of psychosocial counseling, the issue of drug rehabilitation, the issue of, of, of empowering the people should be top priority for our government and our partners. You can build all of the hospitals. The people will still go to seek local medication or herbal medication because why? Mentally, morally, socially, they are not in touch with the hospital and others. So we need to make sure that our government and our partners pay more attention to these areas, the social services, the safety net, social protection, and that will help and, 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 and spend more time on psychosocial, giving the people the kind of counseling that they need after going through all of these trauma. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I think we've run out of time. Deco, oh, if you can give me a second. Yeah. Deco, thank you very much, Deco. I just wanted to introduce uh, Nusha Skali, who's here, who's joined us, who's one of the members in the African Women's Leaders Network. And she has a perspective from uh, the North Africa region. She's tuning in from Morocco. So Nusha, you can, you can prepare a few remarks. And uh, just before that, and I see Nana Oyele, Nana uh, Bampo Ado, you have uh, your hand up. Uh, I think you have something that you'd like to contribute. Très bien, merci de me donner la parole. Vraiment, félicitations pour ce très beau panel. Je voulais juste relever le, le, le paradoxe 
entre le rôle qui est joué par les femmes, qui sont vraiment à l'avant-garde de la lutte contre le, le Covid, aussi bien dans le système de santé, où elles représentent 70%, aussi bien que dans plusieurs métiers, dans les, dans les commerces, elles sont toujours en première ligne, mais en plus à la maison, où elles subissent, comme vous l'avez relevé, les violences accrues, et surtout la précarisation sur le plan économique. Elles perdent leur emploi et elles sont très peu ciblées par les politiques sociales, parce que les politiques sociales, il y a eu des politiques sociales spécialement pour cette phase de Covid, mais elles ont ciblé les chefs de famille en indiquant clairement que les chefs de famille étaient les hommes. C'est-à-dire, sauf quand il n'y a pas d'hommes, à ce moment-là, il y a 20% de familles dont le chef de famille est une femme. Mais autrement, il y a parfois des hommes qui ne, sont pas, qui ne tiennent pas leur responsabilité à l'égard de la famille et c'est eux qui reçoivent la subvention. Alors, je voulais savoir, est-ce que vous ne pensez pas que l'accès des femmes au pouvoir en Afrique, parce qu'on sait qu'en Afrique, il n'y a que 24%, par exemple, des parlementaires qui sont des femmes. Est-ce que l'accès au pouvoir pour les femmes n'est pas le meilleur moyen de permettre aux femmes d'être plus résilientes encore à l'égard d'une crise humanitaire comme le, la pandémie du Covid-19 Merci beaucoup. Nana, if you would kindly offer some of your remarks. Yes, thank you very much. Um, with respect to the mental health, a very critical um, issue. And um, already within our structures, we don't have adequate mental health services. And so with the added on stress that COVID brings in terms of um, even for frontline workers, a lot of the frontline workers are women. A lot of the carers for COVID patients and those in self-isolation are women. Elderly women are more at risk. Young women are more at risk. And we don't have adequate mental health services, but we have development partners supporting our African governments. Our government has been given over $1 million to address COVID. Where were the women? Where were the voices on that table that divided the resources to address COVID in our respective countries? Where were the voices to protect rights of women, to ensure there were adequate mental health services, to ensure girls were protected uh, from child marriage, to ensure rape was addressed? When these hundreds of millions of dollars were being given to our governments, and even from the resources that our governments had, within their COVID response plan, where was women? Where were women? And that is the big question I asked, and this is an issue we need to address. That is why we have all these challenges, and women are being adversely affected by the COVID pandemic. Thank you for your very passionate and uh, vociferous uh, point around the importance of centering women in a lot of the policy responses, as well as uh, in the leadership roles that are required to formulate policies that are sensitive to those who are most exposed and most at risk, particularly as shown during this COVID crisis. I'm going to aggregate a few questions that have been coming in through the chat, just so you can respond. And I also see that Jolly and Caddy have some interventions they'd like to make. So um, we have a question focused on the role of faith organizations. What role do faith organizations have to play, the churches, the mosques, and so on? Uh, there's another question on um, the policy that is focused on a universal basic income, as proposed by the UNDP. Is a universal basic income a model that should be adopted? Um, and then the last question is on the stimulus programs that have been proposed uh, for coping mechanisms for women uh, in, in, you know, who are entrepreneurs in the informal economy. Uh, how has uh, kind of any stimulus that you've seen in your countries, for instance, how have they been structured to support uh, women? So I'm gonna first ask Caddy and Jolly to give uh, their interventions, and then you can re you know, respond to any of the questions uh, that have listed. Caddy? Uh, merci. 
Et donc, euh, moi, mon intervention, en fait, euh, je voulais aussi euh, attirer l'attention sur un fait, c'est que les femmes, surtout euh, dans notre région africaine, ont bravé la COVID-19 pendant le confinement total où on ne devait pas sortir totalement ici à la maison. Les femmes sortaient pour aller travailler. Elles ont été atteintes par euh, la COVID-19 et par manque de moyens et de structures d'accueil, de structures de santé. Plusieurs femmes ont succombé, elles sont mortes et parce qu'elles devaient sortir, parce qu'elles devraient vivre le jour au jour parce qu'elles n'ont pas de moyens et elles devraient sortir pour aller chercher à manger pour leur famille. Parlons aussi de, de, de confinement, les jeunes filles adolescentes et euh, des mineurs étaient violées à longueur de journée par euh, le membre de leur propre famille ou par euh, des voisins. Euh, le viol au sein des, de, de familles, les statistiques démontrent à suffisance le taux de pourcentage alarmant de jeunes filles, de jeunes filles qui sont tombées enceintes suite à ce genre de violences sexuelles euh, commises dans les familles. Et euh, parlons également de, de cas de violences domestiques de mères de famille qui se sont vues euh, affronter ces affres avec de violences domestiques. Elles ont été battues, jetées dehors, humiliées par leur propre mari tout simplement parce qu'elle devrait cohabiter chaque jour avec ces maris-là qui, normalement, en temps normal, ils ne sont pas à la maison. Et donc, elles ont subi tout ce genre de violence. Et même lorsque ces femmes, elles, ont, euh, elles, sont, elles sortaient pour euh, braver la COVID-19, elles faisaient face à des violences policières. Nous, nous en avons épinglé euh, de, de, de taux vraiment euh, alarmants de femmes qui se sont fait euh, violenter par euh, les services euh, des sécurités et donc euh, tout cela dans ce, ce, cet imbroglio de violence à, auquel font face les femmes et les gouvernements est resté inanimé, les rester, rester silencieux, les gouvernements n'a rien fait, aucune mesure pour protéger ces femmes qui bravent au jour le jour les dangers de maladies, de pandémies, de violences domestiques, de viols euh, faits aux, aux, aux petites filles dans, dans, dans des familles et euh, aucune mesure mesure n'a été prise. Et donc, quand on parle de, de, de prise en charge psycho, psychiatrique ou psychologique, il euh, n'y a, y a, y a pas de programme par rapport à ces femmes. Et donc, euh, nous sommes en train de craindre qu'il y ait vraiment un très grand problème à l'avenir, à la langue. Ces femmes vont réchuter et on risque encore d'avoir un taux très élevé des situations de femmes qui sont traumatisées et pourtant, nous étions en train de, de nous concentrer pour sortir de ces traumas mais aujourd'hui, avec la pandémie, ça s'accentue, ça évolue encore. Et euh, comme je l'ai dit aussi avant, nous continuons toujours de déplorer le fait que notre gouvernement ne nous accompagne pas pour euh, complètement éradiquer ce genre de situation. Et la COVID n'est pas, pas prêt pour s'arrêter, ça continue. Et nous continuons toujours à voir combien de femmes continuent de souffrir et d'être de, 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 toujours des victimes. Parlons de l'accès de femmes à la politique ou bien au poste de responsabilité. Là, nous le savons très bien, c'est cela même la solution ultime pour que nous puissions sortir de ce genre de situation. Là où, on, on, comme on dit, éduquer un homme, c'est éduquer juste un homme. Éduquer une femme, c'est éduquer toute une nation. Et donc, c'est de ça dont nous avons besoin. Euh, nous devons faire beaucoup d'efforts pour mettre l'accent sur cette, cette stratégie où la femme doit accéder à des postes de responsabilité pour complètement éradiquer ce mal qui nous gangrène chaque jour dans nos sociétés. Thank you, Kadi Jolly. Oui, merci beaucoup. J'espère que vous m'écoutez. Euh, je pense que, comme Kadi l'a dit, c'est un problème de volonté politique que nous avons, surtout au Congo aujourd'hui. Nous avons toutes les lois qui protègent les femmes. Et en cette période de COVID-19, il y a des violences qui se sont accentuées. Nous venons de mener une recherche où 60% des femmes ont subi des violences domestiques. Elles sont tabassées à longueur de journée par leur mari. C'est devenu le langage. Donc, pour demander à manger à une femme, il faut la taper. Pour demander un habit à une femme, il faut la taper. Elles connaissent des violences et des tracasseries quand elles vont au marché chercher quelque chose pour leur famille. Une femme nous dit que pour amener un bassin d'ananas au marché, elle doit remplir parce qu'elle ne vendra que la moitié. L'autre moitié a été rançonnée sur la route. 
il y a une autre forme de violence qui s'est accentuée. Ce sont les violences euh, qu'on appelle, euh, comment on dit, les mariages précoces. On a documenté 75% des mariages chez les jeunes filles qui ne sont pas rentrées à l'école parce que face à ce désarroi de Covid-19, elles étaient obligées par elles-mêmes, par leur famille à se marier parce que chez nous, la femme est considérée comme une marchandise. Quand on, vous mariez votre fille, la famille a quelque chose pour subvenir à la crise qu'il y avait face au coronavirus. On a eu des euh, grossesses forcées, des femmes violentées. On a eu même des incestes au sein des familles, des pères qui violaient leurs sœurs, des pères qui violaient leurs propres filles, parce que seulement il y avait un stress à gérer, il y avait cette période à gérer. Et face à tout cela, c'est un silence complice de notre gouvernement. C'est un silence catastrophique. Tous les textes adoptés sur le plan national et international ne sont pas mis en œuvre. Et ce sont les organisations qui se démènent par des plaidoyers, par des sensibilisations. Mais je vous dis, la mise en œuvre de ces textes, c'est une catastrophe. Les autorités placent la question de la femme comme un accessoire. Ce n'est pas une priorité. Et on vous dit, c'est votre affaire de femme. Essayez de gérer ça. Et on se demande comment on va résister, comment on va le faire. À un certain moment, face à ces désavoirs, on est tenté d'abandonner. Mais le seul espoir que nous avons aujourd'hui, c'est des femmes braves. C'est ces femmes braves qui ne se lassent pas, c'est ces femmes braves qui continuent à batailler, qui prennent déjà la parole, qui dénoncent, qui témoignent et qui ont appris à s'exprimer pour prendre leur sort à main. Voilà ce que je voulais ajouter. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much for that intervention, uh, Jolly. Really powerful remarks. Uh, I, I'd like to uh, raise something that has come up in the chat, and it has to do with uh, the point that uh, violence against women, gender-based violence, is something that is actually a global phenomenon right now. It's not exclusive to the African continent. The COVID lockdowns has created these dynamics. Um, are there, you know, through your networks uh, that you're connected to, Uh, are there any lessons or any insights uh, or any initiatives that are transnational uh, that are aimed at uh, creating a greater discourse on these questions, critical questions uh, that need to be uh, had, especially around holding governments accountable so they can be more uh, engaged on addressing these structural challenges? Oui. Oui, euh, je peux répondre. On s'est ralliés parce qu'on a senti qu'en étant seul, on était fragile. On était faible en étant seul. On a subi des menaces comme pas possible. Ma collègue Kadi en sait quelque chose. On a subi des menaces, des gens qui nous disaient que nous commençons à nous occuper des choses qui ne nous regardent pas et qu'on aura chacune une balle dans la tête, mais on a survécu. Et on a senti qu'il fallait qu'on s'est ralliés aux autres. On a passé aujourd'hui à des réseaux dans la sous-région de Zola à des réseaux sur le plan africain qui nous aident à apporter plus haut la voix de la femme. Et aujourd'hui, nous avons pensé utiliser quatre stratégies. La première stratégie, c'est l'expression, que les femmes apprennent à prendre la parole, à s'exprimer, à témoigner et à raconter leurs histoires. Parce que quand nous, on en parle, on pense qu'on est en train d'exagérer, on est en train euh, de, de ridiculiser la culture congolaise. La parole d'abord. Des questions comme la, la santé sexuelle et reproduction, je vous dis, on n'en parle pas dans nos familles. On nous dit que c'est un tabou d'en parler. Et nos jeunes apprennent la sexualité sur les réseaux sociaux aujourd'hui avec toutes les conséquences. La deuxième stratégie, c'était la mobilisation. Que les gens comprennent qu'il faille se mettre ensemble pour changer les choses. La troisième stratégie que nous utilisons, c'est la décision. La décision pour changer cette situation. Et la décision, je pense aujourd'hui qu'elle ne viendra pas d'ailleurs. Elle ne viendra pas de la communauté internationale. C'est des problèmes locaux qui nécessitent des solutions locales. Pour dire aux hommes de ne pas taper leurs femmes, ce n'est pas la communauté internationale. Pour dire à l'État congolais de mettre en œuvre les textes juridiques, ce n'est pas l'ONU, ce n'est pas l'Union africaine. C'est une décision qui doit se prendre sur le plan de la RDC. Et la quatrième stratégie que nous utilisons, c'est la phase de la mise en œuvre. Les femmes prennent leur sort à main. Et je vous dévoile ici que depuis 4 ans, 5 ans déjà, nous avons cessé de pleurer, nous les femmes congolaises. Nous avons dit plus de pleurs, plus de larmes, parce que c'est devenu une faiblesse. On sait que nous allons pleurer et ça passe. Aujourd'hui, on a cessé de pleurer. On veut prendre notre sort à main et on réclame un droit. C'est une question de démocratie, ce n'est pas une faveur que nous demandons, c'est une question de droit. Voilà pourquoi nous sommes sur tous les fronts 
je reviens de la marche pour réclamer le tribunal international pour les milliers de femmes enterrées vivantes. Et voilà pourquoi j'ai eu un problème de connexion. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Jolly, for, for those remarks. Um, Nana Oye or Nusa, any yeah. reflections? Yeah, um, yeah, in terms of um, a, transnational, um, a transnational response, I would have thought that with the structures we have at the Africa Union level, where we have the additional charter and we have human rights commissions, and then also at the ECOWAS level, where we have um, a unit and a directorate for women, we have a core of um, gender ministers who meet and um, deliberate on sub-regional issues. I would have thought that at least some interventions, because COVID was global, it was across the African continent, I would have thought that at least some mechanisms or some interventions would have come like from the top bottom, because the bottom was quite um, helpless and vulnerable. So this is what I would like um, to see moving forward, because um, we may have another pandemic, we may have um, a humanitarian crisis. So if um, at the ECOWAS level and at the African Union level, we can use the already existing mechanisms to fashion out um, a response, or at least get some leadership and some support and interventions at that level for women. And then um, what happened in Ghana was that, um, and I'll speak to the strength of social media, we haven't really spoken to how social media and this emerged um, ICT or these new um, technical models of communication really, really helped. In Ghana, there was um, a situation where an 80-year-old woman was lynched she was stoned in, uh, in public. She was stoned because she was accused of being a witch in the northern part of Ghana. And I'm sure she didn't have support. She, was, she wandered from her community into another community and she was stoned. But quickly, um, social media um, brought this to the fore and the Ministry of Gender in Ghana was able to try and, and support and help. And so we also need to talk about how, this, um, how social media and these new emerging technologies can help. Even with um, a FinTech cash transfers, how FinTech can help to quickly um, disperse money to the vulnerable. Every, most people have uh, mobile phones. So how can we use these new um, technology, FinTech, uh, mobile money, cash transfer, to assist and support during a pandemic. I think we, in Africa, we need to look at these opportunities and maximize so that we're able to effectively target the vulnerable populations, especially women and young girls, um, to support in, during a pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Nana, for really raising uh, the issue of how you can innovate uh, using technology and different tools. We have a, a, a participant from Kenya who mentioned uh, in Kenya there's an example of a hotline being set up for uh, gender-based violence victims as well as a rescue center. But she notes that uh, the, the number of these centers are just not sufficient, but it's an example of trying to figure out ways where technology can be used uh, to create safety uh, and support. Um, I'd like to uh, also ask, um, we have about uh, seven minutes. Uh, we have with us here on the line, Maria Teresa Fernandez de la Vega. Um, we'd, like to give, uh, we'd like to give her the floor so she can give some reflecting remarks from her perspective. She's the president of the Women for Africa Foundation. She's also president of State Council uh, in Spain and a great partner of the Yale uh, Africa Initiative. Maria, over to you. Ah, sí, ahora, ahora. ¿Me oyes ahora? Sí. Bueno, pues que estoy muy feliz de estar aquí y de ver a tantas, a tantas amigas, a tantas líderes eh, africanas eh, tan queridas, Deco, Julia, Cadi, Nana, eh, Yoli, eh, todas, eh, muchos, muchos abrazos. Y la verdad es que os he, he estado escuchando muy atentamente y Nusa, también no te he dicho nada, hola Musa, Nusa, eh, pero la verdad es que mmm, todo lo que habéis estado diciendo es lo mismo que pasa en todos sitios, pero agravado allí donde las cosas funcionan 
las mujeres estamos en mayor situación de desigualdad. Y esto no tiene otro arreglo que, que, que insistir muchísimo en que tenemos que cambiar la gobernanza y para eso tenemos que estar en los circuitos del poder. Poder en los gobiernos, poder en la sociedad civil, poder en las organizaciones de mujeres, porque es la única forma en que podemos cambiar las cosas. Porque es evidente que aquí lo que ya va mal va peor con la pandemia. Pero eso está pasando no solo en África, también en mi país, en España. La gente que está en el paro, las mujeres que están en el paro, que no tienen trabajo, lo están pasando muy mal en la pandemia. Y si eso todavía ocurre, a eso unimos lo de la violencia, pues el tema de la violencia con un, con una, uh, confi un confinamiento en el domicilio, que es donde se produce la mayor violencia, pues aumenta la violencia. Entonces, eh, nuestros mecanismos para que desde la, desde la sociedad podamos cambiar esto es estar donde se toman las decisiones, es estar mandando, es estar con las organizaciones. Porque cuando se dejan los gobiernos, los gobiernos hacen cosas por, por combatir la pandemia, los hospitales, pero no se preocupan de más de la mitad de la ciudadanía que está sufriendo consecuencias eh, muy eh, irreversibles en una situación tan grave como una pandemia eh, que estamos viviendo. Y está ocurriendo en todo el mundo. Las víctimas mayores y más numerosas son las mujeres y las niñas porque están en peor situación social, porque están en peor situación política, desde las clases medias hasta las clases que económicamente tienen menos recursos. Y todos los proyectos que tenemos en marcha para ir cambiando esto, con la pandemia se han parado. Y ahora vamos a tener consecuencias de mayor desigualdad, no solo en violencia y en temas de retraso, sino también económicas, porque las va a tener todo el mundo, también los hombres. Pero las mujeres siempre cinco, 100 veces más. Entonces, tenemos que seguir trabajando, de verdad. Tenemos que seguir trabajando y tenemos que, 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 que ser conscientes de que para cambiar esto tenemos que cambiar todo lo que estamos, las sociedades en las que estamos viviendo. Y las tenemos que cambiar ya. No, te, no tenemos tiempo. Hay que, hay que acelerar. Tenemos programas, tenemos, hacemos cosas, hacemos lo que podemos. Pero tenemos que poder hacer más. Y tenemos que hacerlo con más inteligencia, porque ya sabemos lo que pasa. O es que nos sorprende que ahora, nos sorprendemos que durante la pandemia nos estén tratando peor a las niñas y a las mujeres, que se haya acabado el trabajo, que haya más violencia. Yo no me sorprendo, me, me, me horrorizo, pero al final no me sorprende porque esto pasa siempre. Y porque veo que está pasando que en, incluso en los temas menores... Los prejuicios, cualquier prejuicio, incluso de menor nivel que estos que estamos mencionando, que son gravísimos porque atentan a la vida y a la salud de las mujeres, también en eso las mujeres somos perdedoras en todo, en todo en una situación de pandemia. ¿Por qué? Pues porque los gobiernos se concentran en tratar de luchar contra la pandemia para la población en general, pero no atienden a la especificidad de la mitad de la ciudadanía. Y, y cuando la intentan atender, no llegan. No llegan. Y entonces, la violencia se incrementa. Y a mí me gustaría saber qué está pasando en las zonas de conflicto, donde hay un conflicto armado en África, donde hay... ¿Qué está pasando? Pues estoy segura que se ha agravado la situación del conflicto también, pero con, 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 con consecuencias muy negativas uh, para la, las poblaciones más precarias y más debilitadas socialmente, políticamente y desde un punto de vista sanitario. Y por tanto, yo creo que hay una cosa que tenemos clara, que es que tenemos claro lo que tenemos que hacer y lo que tenemos que hacer lo tenemos que hacer con urgencia. Yo creo que tenemos que salir de la, tendríamos que intentar salir de la pandemia con el firme compromiso de, de, de incrementar todo nuestro esfuerzo a partir de ahora para poder acortar los tiempos para llegar a tener los medios y los recursos que nos permitan cambiar las cosas. Va a haber elecciones en África ahora, en varios países, y va a haber varias candidatas a presidenta. Entonces yo tengo una enorme esperanza en que podamos trabajar para, apoyar, para apoyarlas, para que ganen las elecciones, porque si no, no vamos a poder cambiar nunca las cosas, amigas. En África, 
vamos a seguir trabajando como lo hemos hecho hasta ahora, como lo hacéis todas vosotras que os dejáis la vida y todo vuestro tiempo para que las cosas avancen. Y avanzan muy lentamente, pero luego de repente viene una pandemia y se cae todo lo que hemos avanzado. Y se sufre, quien sufre son las poblaciones vulnerables. Y en esas poblaciones vulnerables estamos las mujeres, en todo el mundo. Entonces yo lo que, mi única esperanza es que aprendamos esta lección ya, pero grabada, grabada como nos la están grabando con sangre. Nos la están grabando con sangre. La pandemia nos está grabando la desigualdad con sangre. Porque no, va, no hemos mejorado durante la pandemia nada. Hemos retrocedido. Y hemos visto la, la, la debilidad que tenemos para poder ayudar a las mujeres más vulnerables. A las poblaciones más vulnerables. A las niñas. De verdad, no es posible. No es posible que sigamos así. Y yo creo que de verdad esta es una lección que como esta pandemia ha sido en todo el mundo, deberíamos salir las mujeres con el firme, en todo el mundo con el firme compromiso de a nivel internacional, a nivel eh, nacional, a nivel local, reforzar a las organizaciones de mujeres, reforzar a las mujeres en los gobiernos y decir que esta es la única vía, la única vía, la vía más para llegar más cerca. Yo, sabéis que la Fundación Mujeres por África va a estar ahí, vamos a reforzar todo nuestro, nuestro esfuerzo, salimos con la experiencia aprendida de estas reuniones que hemos mantenido durante este tiempo, que eso sí que nos ha servido, hemos reforzado las redes de científicas, hemos reforzado las, la, las líderes sociales desde la Fundación en lo que hemos podido, entonces vamos a, a, a seguir reforzándolo para, a la, en la salida de esto, salir con otra fuerza y más unidas, y con más posibilidades de salir adelante. Tenemos que recuperar la esperanza, porque las mujeres salen muy doloridas de esta pandemia, muy, muy doloridas y muy, muy, muy afectadas. Muchas gracias a todas por vuestro esfuerzo y vamos a seguir trabajando en esas líneas, en la línea de saber que la conclusión es que las mujeres en, esta, en estos meses de la pandemia COVID, que todavía no se ha acabado, hemos perdido mucho. Porque siempre que hay una guerra, y esta es una guerra terrible, pues estamos perdiendo. Estamos perdiendo vidas, no hemos ganado nada. Pero es verdad que hemos ganado la conciencia, eso sí, de que tenemos que seguir continuando en nuestra lucha, pero con mucha más fuerza y con mucha más mmm, energía, bueno, energía no, porque yo sé que todas ponéis toda vuestra energía, pero a lo mejor pues aprendiendo de, de aquello que hemos visto que ya una vez más nos, nos tiene que hacer reforzarnos desde un punto de vista de la solidaridad y desde el punto de vista de la cooperación y la organización eh, a nivel de todos nuestros países. Y muchas gracias a Yale, ¿eh? Eh, por ayudarnos a mantener estos debates, a estar juntas eh, y, y, a, y a poder pensar estrategias nuevas que nos permitan abordar de forma uh, más rápida, más eficaz, los retos que tenemos que alcanzar, que todavía nos quedan mucho por delante. Thank you very much, María Teresa, uh, for those reflective remarks uh, on this important session. Um, this obviously is a really important conversation that we cannot fully uh, address uh, all the issues in one session. Nevertheless, uh, this is a continuing conversation that we hope uh, will happen offline as, as was outlined by the women, the strong women on this panel. Uh, it's critically important that we continue to raise the alarm uh, on the issues being uh, experienced by women and girls and even young boys uh, in this a period of COVID-19 and lockdown. Um, it's been a pleasure to have uh, all you women here. Uh, as someone who was raised by strong African women, uh, as an African, I'm tremendously grateful for your courage, your tenacity, and your commitment. I think there's an important role for women, who, for men who are allies in this cause uh, to step up and speak out and, and then come in solidarity with you against uh, gender-based violence on our continent. So thank you for your efforts. We appreciate all you do. Uh, thank you for those of you who've tuned in from across the globe. 
uh, men and women uh, who care about these issues uh, in this moment in history. Uh, we will have subsequent sessions. Uh, the chat will be sent uh, to all the participants via email because there are interventions from the speakers that could be useful to those of you who participated. Thank you once again to all the organizers behind the scenes who helped us, the interpreters, uh, and we look forward to seeing you at our next session. Deco, we're very grateful for your moderation. We appreciate you tuning in. Nuzai, it's great to see you. Maria Teresa from Spain, Jolly from DRC, Nana from Ghana, great to have you here. Thank you and goodbye.